God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden can now be heard Monday through Friday mornings at 7 a.m. Central, 8 Eastern, and on Sunday mornings at 6 a.m. Central, 7 Eastern. Join him and let's turn our country back to God. It only takes a spark to start a forest fire. Let's get on fire for the Lord, right here on K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network. The staff of K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network is proud to announce that our very own Rowdy Rick Robinson has been selected as one of the top conservative talk show hosts in the nation for his program, America Off the Rail. Again, congratulations to Rowdy Rick Robinson for a job well done and another reason to stay connected to K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at rahardin.com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit amazon.com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. For past programs of God's Pure Word of Faith, go to www.spreaker.com. That's Spreaker. S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R.com. In the search box at the top of the page, enter my name, Richard Harden, H-A-R-D-I-N, and click on it. A picture with a cross and God's pure word of faith, Richard Harden, will show up. Click on the picture of the cross. A listing of all the past programs will then show up. You're listening to God's pure word of faith with Richard Harden. Richard will guide you through the Bible and help you find God's purpose for your life. Now here's teacher and author Richard Harden. Welcome to God's Pure Word of Faith. I'm Richard Harden, and I want to just thank the Lord and thank the management of K98Talk.com for this great opportunity to share with you again about God's Word. I'm going to be sharing with you this morning a story about the book of Nehemiah, and the title of that is from the main character of the story, Nehemiah, who was a cupbearer to a king. He was in, you know, uh, deported into slavery. And he was actually serving the king where he was, you know, had been deported to. Well, uh, Jerusalem, the capital and everything, had been left in disrepair. Most of the people had been deported in other places also. So uh, very few people lived there. There were a lot of empty houses and stuff, so local foreigners you might say came in and lived in these houses and they mixed in with the priesthood and it was just in terrible condition uh, no one took care of the physical plant you might say and the walls were crumbling falling down the, the gates to the city to protect the city was you know broken down it was just complete disrepair and uh, some of the people came from uh, Nehemiah's homeland and told him about this and um, they said the remnant or the people that were left there in captivity in a providence are in great affliction, reproach. And the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and the gates thereof are burned with fire. So they're just wide open to uh, any kind of attack or people, you know, coming against them. And um, it's kind of a similarity to what our country is like today with our walls down. Uh, just people just coming in freely to our country and... and you know, uh, living wherever they want to like that. These people, you know, lived in Jerusalem um, that, you know, weren't Jews and everything, mixed in with the priesthood, the religious spiritual condition of the uh, city was terrible, like the religious 
you know, spiritual condition of our country is, you know, being uh, freedoms taken away and, you know, uh, just persecuting Christians and different things like this. You know, it's just pushing God out of everything. Well, that's, that's the way it was there. They were just living in almost complete disrepair. And so when Nehemiah heard about this, now the reason I'm sharing this today is because we need a Nehemiah to come forth in our country. Uh, Nehemiah is the last book of history about the Jews before the birth of Jesus. And uh, he then sought the Lord. He was so upset when these people came and told him how bad Jerusalem, the condition of Jerusalem was. Uh, he started seeking the Lord and praying and everything. Well, you know, when somebody gets a burden like that, normally that person's the one God's going to call, you know, to uh, do the work. Anyway, Nehemiah then uh, fasted and prayed, and he had to go in. You know, he was a cup buried or taste, you know, the uh, or drink the wine before the king would because if it was poisonous or something, well, then the cup bearer would be the one that would, you know, get the poison first and protect the king. Anyway, he was the cup bearer for the king. And uh, he prayed and sought the Lord. He went into the king. Well, he was selected, and God called him out then, and, and uh, the king allowed him to go. He went back to Jerusalem. He restored or rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem um, and cleaned out the foreigners from mixing in with the priesthood, and he helped turn the nation back to God. And that's what we need. We need a cleansing in our country, you know, and, um, a rededication and a turning to the Lord, the God of the Bible, you know, that helped establish this country 200 years ago. We need a Nehemiah today to close and rebuild our walls or our borders and uh, get this spiritual condition headed back in the right direction. But before I get too far into that, I want to share with you about uh, how to get to my website, which has, you know, several. Um, Items of information. I have 18 videos linked to it that you can go to and listen to many different, uh, you know, subjects. I have six books that uh, are described in the website and uh, information how to obtain those books. Uh, a blog with 20-something messages. Also, uh, we have 40-something podcast of previous broadcast stored in Spreaker and I'll also uh, explain to you how you can get to those previous podcasts because there's one that's very important with today's uh, message it's uh, well the US versus Isaiah 9-11 it appears that something happened in uh, described in the book of Isaiah about a uh, condition similar to our 9-11 and how the people of Isaiah's day that he was talking about how they responded in the same way that we responded or vice versa we responded in the same way they did and uh, how God was displeased with them and their response and everything and there was a rapture in Isaiah before God brought about his uh, punishment for them so it, it appears that you know our 9-11 and the uh, story in Isaiah, are, well, are very similar and may have some, you know, significance for us today. And, and the title of that podcast is, you know, U.S. versus Isaiah 9-11. And I'll explain to you how you can get to those previous podcasts if you're a new listener. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at R-A-H-A-R-D-I-N dot com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit Amazon dot com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. For past programs of God's Pure Word of Faith, go to www.spreaker.com. That's Spreaker. S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R.com. 
In the search box at the top of the page, enter my name, Richard Harden, H-A-R-D-I-N, and click on it. A picture with a cross and God's pure word of faith, Richard Harden, will show up. Click on the picture of the cross. A listing of all the past programs will then show up. Welcome back. Now I'm going to be reading most of today's material from the book of Nehemiah uh, and showing you the development of this, how after I explained a while ago that uh, some of Nehemiah's friends, he was in captivity as a cupbearer to the king um, that had deported uh, most of the Jews from Jerusalem back to his kingdom and was uh, using them as slaves and servants and everything. Well, when people came and told Nehemiah how bad Jerusalem was as far as the uh, structures falling down the walls and the gates and things like this and then the, how, how bad the uh, priesthood was and everything. Well, he was very sad about it. said he wept, he mourned, and prayed and fasted. But doesn't say what God said to him. But um, after explaining that, you know, he prayed and, and, and repented and confessed the sins of the people and confessed his sins and, you know, leading up to this uh, captivity and everything. And then in chapter 2 of Nehemiah, he has to go back in before the king, you know, daily, you know, like that to perform his duties and stuff. Well, here it just says that, uh, now I had not been before time sad in his presence. Now, this is one of the things, you know, he was sad about the condition of Jerusalem and burdened and everything, and he had been praying for several days and talking to the Lord, but he went before the king sad. Now, that was something that the people weren't supposed to do. You know, uh, the king wanted people to be smiling and happy around him and everything. He didn't want, you know, people coming in, you know, grumbling, griping, you know, bad attitudes and things like this. So it says that he had never before been sad in the king's presence. And the king said, to, uh, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? And uh, this is nothing else but sorrow of the heart. Then it says here that uh, Nehemiah says, And I was very sore afraid, because, you know, uh, that, that wasn't the way it's supposed to be. And uh, he said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my fathers, the sepulchres, lieth waste, and the gates are ever consumed with fire? And, you know, it, it says in the scriptures that the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, and turneth the king however he will. And also in Proverbs it says, A preparation of the heart and man to answer the tongue is from the Lord. God had already been working in that king even though he may not have known it or, you know, like that. But his response here, the king said unto Nehemiah, For what dost thou make a request? And so he responded then and said to the king, If it please the king that let me go back, let me go back to my city and, um, and do something about this. And, and give me letters, you know, like that, for protection as I travel and go back, you know, across the different lands like that and through the different jurisdictions and everything. Uh, letters of protection, you know, from the king. And um, letters to the people that control the king's forest and things that, that I can, you know, get the wood and the, the, well, the things that I need to restore Jerusalem, you know, the walls and the gates and everything. And, uh, and the king granted it to him, and just according to, you know, what he asked for and everything. Uh, the king went along with it, and he asked him, well, how long are you going to be gone? He said, well, he didn't know about that and everything, but that he would, you know, go perform the work and come back and report to the king and everything. Well, uh, that was kind of amazing to him and everything, but God had, you know, set this up to where uh, he was sending Nehemiah now as the one to go back and um, straighten things out. There was a problem with that, though, because when he got there, there was a guy called Sinballat, a Horite, and uh, Tobiah, a servant over there, and an Ammonite. Now, Ammonite was some of Lot's descendants. They were there. And uh, 
he had to face these people. They did not want him to do any of the things. Because see, they were prospering there. It might say, you know, living free and uh, living off the Jews, the few that were left there and everything. But uh, when Nehemiah got to Jerusalem, it said he rose in the night with a few men, and he didn't tell anybody what he was doing. But he surveyed the city. He went around the city at nighttime, and he looked at the gates and the walls and all these different things to see just how bad everything was. Uh, and then he went up to the nobles and rulers and talked to them about it and said, you know, you see the distress that we're in. Jerusalem lieth in waste. Uh, let us build up the walls of Jerusalem that we no more be a reproach to all the people around us. Now when uh, Sanballat and Tobiah and uh, Jeshem and Arabian, when these three heard about it, uh, they were benefiting very much from the condition that uh, Jerusalem was in because they were living off the people, you know, and uh, cheating them and different things like this. Uh, they heard it. They started laughing at him, scorned him, and, uh, and, you know, did everything they could to kind of, you know, cause them to, you know, uh, be disheartened and everything in, in, in their effort and everything. And they said, what is this thing that you do? Will you rebel against the king? And uh, Nehemiah answered him, The God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore, we his servants will arise and build, but ye have no portion, no right, no memorial in Jerusalem. He was telling them, you know, this is none of your business and everything. You know, this is our land and so on. And then uh, even the high priest and everything, he wasn't in, in too much of agreement with what was going on here. Uh, Again, when Sanballat heard that uh, they were building the walls and, and saw how fast they did it, what well, it turned out that it only took them 52 days to rebuild the walls. He was very mad and upset, and uh, he mocked the Jews and everything. And he, you know, they said things like, "What do these feeble Jews do? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end of the day and revive the stones out of heaps of rubbish?" And then um, lost descendants and the rest of them jumped in. They were, you know, trying to, you know, uh, discourage them and, and get them to stop. Well, his response, uh, Nehemiah's response was, Hear, O our God, for we are despised and turn their reproach upon their own head. Now, see, a lot of times this happened throughout the scriptures of what people were trying to do to the people of God. God had it come back upon them, like in you know the book of Esther, where um, Esther's uncle Mordecai uh, was being despised by Haman, the evil man that was going to kill all the Jews in the book of Esther. Well, Haman hated uh, Mordecai, the Jew, so bad that he built a scaffold to hang him, have him hung, right out in you know the middle of the city. Well, it turned out that Haman himself was the first person hung on that scaffold that he had built to hang Mordecai. God had turned it around to where he had protected Mordecai and Haman was the one hung on it. And this is what uh, Nehemiah is praying here. He says, turn their reproach upon their own head and give them a prey in the land of captivity. And um, But it came to pass that uh, Sanballat, Tobiah, and the Arabians and others that were against him uh, heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and that the breaches began to be stopped and and they were very very mad so they started conspiring against Nehemiah and the people and they came to fight against Jerusalem but Nehemiah nevertheless we made our prayer unto God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. Now see, his response every time these people come against him is to turn to God. And that's why we've got to be in our life. You know, we've got to be any time. Well, one of my favorite scriptures is Philippians 4, 6 says, and be anxious for nothing, but in all things with prayer and supplications let and with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And that's what's happening to him. Every time these people come against him 
and, and them rebuilding the walls, he turns to the Lord and prays. Uh, and again, these people, the adversaries end, uh, they shall not know, neither see, till we come in in the midst of them and slay them and cause the work to cease. See, they were lived uh, to where they were going to be coming in and, and like spies into the city and causing disruptions and things like that to stop the walls from being built. And it came to pass, you know, that uh, they looked and rose up and, and said to the nobles, to the rulers, to the rest of the people, Be ye not afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible, and fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, and your wives, and your children. He's encouraging the people inside the Jerusalem and everything because, you know, there's such a mixture of people there and everything, and it's, it's hard to get this, you know, separation to where, you know, they can have complete control. And God had brought their counsel to naught. That is, these uh, people that were going to sneak in and and stop the work and just destroy things like this. God brought it to light so they could defend against it. And um, naturally, that made them so mad and everything like that, too. But what Nehemiah did then, he armed all the people, had them, you know, get their... Uh, spears and swords and things like this and actually work some of them had uh, they held spears in their hands as they were working and other people were you know uh, uh, watching for protection he put them in shifts half of them would you know watch to defend the city and the other half would be working with spears in their hand that's how you know bad the situation was for them and uh, he just went on like this, back and forth. It came then that the, it says there was a great cry of the people and of their wives against the brethren of the Jews. That is that what happened was during the time before Nehemiah, right before he got there, uh, these, um, well, um, Sanballat and the other one that was against him, everything was charging these people and actually um, making them pay rent for the houses they were living in. And they said, we have to borrow money of the king's tribute to pay for our lands and vineyards and things. Well, he got very angry. He said, I was very angry when I heard their cry and these words, and I consulted with my nobles. I rebuked the nobles and rulers and said unto them, you exact usury or, you know, uh, interest rates, high interest rates, uh, every one of his brother, and I said a great assembly against them. Well, they're, the Jews that he was talking to, these nobles and everything, they repented, they held their peace, and um, and he told them it's not good. You shouldn't do this to your brother and everything uh, because of the fear of God like this. So he straightens this out, and they agreed then to restore uh, their lands to them and to cut out the high interest rates and all this stuff they were charging these um, poor Jews living throughout the city and everything. Uh, we'll restore them and we'll require nothing of them so that we can do as thou sayest. Then I called the priest and took an oath of them that they would do according to their promise and everything. See he's starting to straighten up now the, the priesthood, the treatment of these people is building the walls and doing all this. Now it came to pass that uh, Sanballat, Tobiah and Geshem, the Arabian, and the rest of the enemies, you know, uh, they were going to do everything they could to not allow the gates to be rebuilt. See, the walls have been rebuilt now, but they can still get in and out through the gates. And uh, they decided, well, we'll send to him. And they sent a message to Nehemiah and says, um, come, let us meet together in one of the villages and but uh, they sought to do you know, him mischief and everything. They were going to hurt him and do something. But he sent back to a messenger and said, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. So why should the work cease while I leave it and come down to you? In other words, he wasn't going to come to him. He said, I'm going to stay here and do the work. And uh, then they sent to him four times after that. They kept sending messages. We want to talk with you. We want to deal with you. And, and he knew what they were trying to do, so he refused to. And uh, he says, uh, Geshem said, Thou and the Jews think to rebel 
they're, they're sending a message back to the king now. They're, they they can't get him to respond correctly. So they're going to send a message back and say that he's building the walls, he's going to make himself king, and he's going to rebel then from uh, the king that had allowed him to come over and rebuild the walls. And he uh, said he's preaching that he's going to be the king. And so let's see here. He responds then, there's no such thing done that thou sayest, but thou, you know, just makes this up out of your own heart and mind, you know, and you're lying against us and everything here. So they can't get him to respond in however they want him to like that. So they're going to threaten him, you know, with telling the king that he's rebelling and everything so that the king will come over sir. And they keep saying, let us meet together in the house of the Lord and everything. Why should such a... Uh, Man, as I flee, well, they wanted to Nehemiah to go hide in the uh, temple, and so that these people wouldn't hurt him. He says, "Why should such a man as I flee, uh, being who I am, uh, to go into the temple to save my life? I will not go in." And he said, "I perceive that God had not sent this guy to him to tell him to do that." So. Uh, he refused to go in and hide from these people. He was going to trust in God to take care of them. And he said, My God, thank thou upon Tobiah and Sanballat according to their works. He's praying again, Lord, deliver me from them. The walls were finished in 52 days. They got the uh, gates and everything restored. Then they started looking through the um, past history of the tribes and everything to allow these people then you know um, the certain correct citizens to live in the city and they were going to get rid of the other people you know they were going to uh, separate this out and um, make sure that the right people were living in the city from then on the correct Jews and everything and I'll take a short break and be right back God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden can now be heard Monday through Friday mornings at 7 a.m. Central, 8 Eastern, and on Sunday mornings at 6 a.m. Central, 7 Eastern. Join him and let's turn our country back to God. It only takes a spark to start a forest fire. Let's get on fire for the Lord, right here on K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network. For past programs of God's Pure Word of Faith, go to www.spreaker.com. That's Spreaker. S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R.com. In the search box at the top of the page, enter my name, Richard Harden, H-A-R-D-I-N, and click on it. A picture with a cross and God's Pure Word of Faith, Richard Harden, will show up. Click on the picture of the cross. A listing of all the past programs will then show up. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at rahardin.com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit Amazon.com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. Welcome back. Well, Nehemiah and the Jews there in Jerusalem had restored the walls. They've built them back up. They've built the gates up. And they had to do this, you know, working with a, a sword in one hand and, you know, working with the other and, Half the people, you know, were standing ready to fight to protect from Sanballat and all of these people that was discouraging this. These were the foreigners that had lived in the city and had kind of taken over after the majority of them were deported uh, from outside. Well, uh, they get all this built. They join together then, and they go through the genealogy of of all the different tribes of you know the people that lived around there to make sure 
that in a sense it was like checking out the uh, citizenship list, the genealogy of the Jews and everything, who was supposed to be living in Jerusalem, you know, who were the true Jews and stuff, and they were separating out then all, you might say, the illegals and uh, people that had just moved in uh, empty houses when all the rest of the people were deported out and everything and just come in and were destroying the city. They were cleaning, cleaning it out. After this, they get over and they start a, a worship service. They start praising the Lord, you know, and uh, uh, the priest that had come over from uh, with uh, Nehemiah, they had a worship service and they got all these people together and everything. And as he started reading the book uh, of the law, these people had been so long since they had heard it and everything like that, they, they started just crying because it meant so much to them. They started crying and Ezra, the priest, said, Bless the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen. And they started lifting up their hands and worshiping, praising the Lord and everything. And, and they were crying so much that then one of the famous scriptures that a lot of Christians you know, remember like this is Nehemiah um, 8.10. It says, And he, the priest, said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto the Lord, and neither be ye sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Uh, we've heard that verse Many of us that have been in you know uh, church for years a lot. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Well, that's what it's talking about here. And because they were crying, they were so uh, joyful of hearing God's word again and being read out in public um, before everybody, like they had done before. Because that's the way they could hear God's word. You know, cause probably the priests were the only ones that could read to where he could read the word to them and they gathered then as families and everything to hear it and and they were so happy they were crying about it and everything well as this happens then it says uh, they also got together and they read in the uh, scriptures it says here that uh, on the day they read in the book of Moses in the audience of the people, and therein was found written that the Ammonites and the Moabites should not come into the congregation of God forever. Uh, that was because of, it says because they met not the children of Israel with bread and water, but hired Balaam against them. You know, back in the old days, uh, to, to curse them, but he wasn't able to curse them. God didn't allow him to, and everything. But because of the problems when the children of Israel came out of slavery. They were supposed to pass by these countries, and God had told them. Because, see, the Ammonites now were the descendants of Lot, and he had told the children of Israel when they came out, leave them alone. He told them, leave the uh, Edomites alone, Esau's descendants. He said, I'm not giving you a foot of their land. So God protected these countries and everything from the children of Israel when they came out. Now, these are the people that are coming in there, you know, have been living there and and been a part of destroying Jerusalem until Nehemiah come back, God brought him back and started rebuilding it. So when they saw that these people weren't supposed to be in here, they started cleaning house. And uh, it says, Now it came to pass when they heard the law that they separated from Israel all the mixed multitude. Now what it means by mixed multitude was the uh, mixed races and everything. Uh, the mixed races and the people living there that were not Jews. And uh, now the priest that had oversight to all of this, uh, he had a problem with this because he was in cahoots with Tobiah and them in, in taking these uh, finances and everything from the Jews that were still there and charging them, you know, the high uh, interest rates and stuff. And and misappropriating, you might say, the funds of the temple because um, Tobiah and, uh, well, these others were living off of the people and the priest was aiding it. And now, uh, let me share with you. He said, when I came to Jerusalem and understood of the evil 
that the priest did for Tobiah in preparing him a chamber in the court of the house of God. Uh, the priest had even allowed Tobiah to live in the temple. And I gr it grieved me sore, therefore. I cast forth all the household stuff of Tobiah out of the chamber. He went in there, he threw it out. And I commanded that they cleanse the chambers, and thither brought I again the vessels of the, of the house of God with the meat offerings and frankincense. And, you know, they were using the uh, utensils of the temple for themselves and everything. He said, I perceive that the portions of the Levites, um, the Levites were the, you know, the, the priest, the priestly uh, tribe of the 12 tribes uh, that were supposed to be serving in the temple and taking care of it and everything. And they were supposed to be living off of the contributions and living off of the tithes that the other people would send in. Well, the few Levites that were there, um, they weren't getting those tithes. And it said here, I perceive that the portions of the Levites had not been given to them. See, they were taking these tithes from the people, but they were giving it to someone else. And that's almost like today, you know, taking the taxes from the people and giving it to other people and everything. Like that and living off of them. Anyway, I perceive that the portions of the Levites had not been given them for the Levites and the singers that did the work of the temple were fled every one to his field. They had to go out and not only, you know, in trying to take care of the temple and everything, but they had to go out and work themselves to provide for their own, you know, uh, things to eat and take care of them. Then I contended with the rulers and said, Why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their place. Then brought all Judah the tithe of corn and new wine and oil unto the treasuries. See, he got them to start bringing it back into the treasuries. And uh, he cleaned out the people that were operating the treasuries and everything. And he said, I saw uh, in Judah some treading wine presses on the Sabbath. You know, treading wine presses with, you know, the grapes and everything like that. They would process those and make the wine out of it and everything. And they weren't supposed to be working on the Sabbath. He said, And I saw in Jerusalem, Judah some treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in sheaves and lading the donkeys, you know, bringing in to sell things uh, wine and grape and figs. And, and all manner of burdens like this were being brought back and forth on the Sabbath, which they brought to Jerusalem. And I testified against them in the day wherein they sold these things. It was just, you know, like a regular marketplace on the Sabbath of, of coming and going and selling and buying and everything like this. And he said, There dwelt men of Tyre there also, which brought fish and all manner of ware, and sold it on the Sabbath to the children of Judah and in Jerusalem. And Nehemiah says, And I contended with the nobles of Judah and said unto them, what evil thing is this that you do and profane the Sabbath? Did not your fathers thus? And he's, he's saying, this is what happened to us years ago that caused us to be, just, you know, uh, uh, brought into captivity and our nation to be destroyed. He said, did not your fathers the same thing? And did not your, did not God bring all this evil on us and upon this city? Yet you bring more wrath on Israel by profaning the Sabbath. You know, continuing to do that. You know, not getting any better. You know, it, it, we're still doing the same thing. You're doing the same thing that got us into this trouble in the first place with God. And it came to pass when the gates of Jerusalem began to be dark, that is in the evenings, before the Sabbath, I commanded that the gates should be shut. See, so he's going to shut those gates and charge that they should not be open until after the Sabbath. See, he's going to keep all those money changers and all those people, you know, selling fish and, you know, bringing in the fruit and stuff like this for the Sabbath. He says, and charged them they should not open until after the Sabbath. And some of my servants set I to gates that they, there should, you know, no burden be brought in on the Sabbath day. So the merchants and sellers of all kind were lodged without Jerusalem once or twice. See, so the people came up to bring their wares to sell and to trade on the Sabbath, but they couldn't get in, so they sat outside waiting. 
And they figured, you know, that sooner or later, you know, they'd open the gates and they'd come in and do it. But he wouldn't let them in until after the Sabbath. And then uh, Nehemiah says, I testified against them, said unto them, Why lodge you outside the wall? If you do so again, <laughs> listen to this. He says, If you keep doing that, if you do it again, I will lay hands on you. Now, that might have been one of the first expressions of laying on of hands in the Bible. But anyway, he's going to lay hands on them and it's not going to be, you know, to heal them. It's going to be, you know, to get rid of them. From that time forth came they no more on the Sabbath. So he ran them off. And I commanded the Levites, now this is the people of the tribe of priests for the Israelites, that they should cleanse themselves and that they should come and keep the gates to sanctify the Sabbath day. Remember me, O oh my God, concerning this, and spare me according to the greatness of thy mercy. So he's... he's had a burden for Jerusalem, had felt in such repair. He had prayed and sought the Lord, and God called him then to go before the king. And then the king gave him papers and gave him authority to come back over to Jerusalem and restore the walls. And they had to, you know, defend himself the whole time from all these uh, foreigners and people that were benefiting from this um, group of Jews that were remaining there. They were cheating them charge them high prices and everything like this and high interest rates. So Nehemiah and his people, they built the walls in such a record time that, that the people around knew that it was God helping them, but they still resisted them as much as they could. They built the, rebuilt the gates, and now he's cleaning out the, um, you might say, religious community and getting it straightened back up and headed truly toward God. And he said, in those days also, uh, I saw that uh, Jews had married wives of Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. See, there's such a mixture now of, of, you know, children marrying, you know, just anybody and everything. And their children spake half in the speech of Ashdod, and they could not even speak the Jewish language, but according to the language of each people. And Nehemiah says, I contended with them, and he says here he cursed them, or he reviled them, you know, and, and let them know that's not right. You know, in fact, the scripture says that the 400 years in uh, slavery was a period of time that God actually purified the Jews to, to keep them separate from everyone else. And at, in that 400 years, they were a purified nation of, you know, blood and everything and uh, a special people to him. Now, but now... It's interracial marriage and everything, and it's just it's such a mixture of, of people and everything. He says, I reviled them and smote certain of them. <laughs> and he says here, he even plucked off their hair, you know, pulled out their hair, and made them swear by God, saying, Ye shall not give your daughters unto their sons, nor take their daughters unto your sons or for yourselves. And then he says, Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things yet among many nations was there no king like him who was beloved of his God and, and see and so much so that he was the wealthiest king ever in Israel it says nevertheless even him even Solomon did outlandish things with the women that caused his sin this, you know he had so many wives he had brought in from foreigners and everything and they brought their you know, false gods with them. And in the end of Solomon's life, you'll see that he actually started worshiping these false gods with all these different women that he had married and everything. And he had, uh, you know, um, five or six hundred wives and, you know, 700 and something concubines and all this. So there was a lot of false gods that he allowed to bring in and, and to actually be a part of worshiping them. And that's what Nehemiah's reminding them here what happened to Solomon, the wisest man, the richest man. God blessed him so much. But all these false gods and things uh, had wiped him out. Also, then uh, his son was very evil after him. Solomon's son was. He said he did evil because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. And uh, the kingdom was split up and everything, almost destroyed. And then Nehemiah says here, Shall we then hearken unto you and do all this great evil to transgress against our God in marrying strange wives? 
and one of the sons of uh, the priest, his son-in-law, was a you know, see, was a son-in-law to Sanballat. See, even these people that had been hindering him all the time and everything come to find out that Sanballat's son-in-law had married the priest's daughter. Okay, he said, um, the Horite, therefore I chased him from me. They chased him out. Remember them. Oh my God, because they have defiled the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and of the Levites. Thus cleansed I them from all strangers and appointed the ward of the priest and the Levites, every one in his business. And so here, he had a lot bigger job than he thought when he went over to Jerusalem. He thought he was going to go over and you know, uh, rebuild the walls and rebuild the uh, gates and everything. But he found such corruption that uh, Sanballat was living in the temple. You know, this uh, foreigner was living in the temple. And he was actually running things behind the priest. The priest was his front man. He had married his his son to the priest's daughter and it was just such a intermingling of everything and corruption and stuff and that's what we have in our society today not only in politics but in our religious community and and you know the two or three hundred different denominations and everything one teaching this one teaching the opposite back and forth such a mixture of of you know just what is called religion and then we have um, anybody that wants to can sign up and, and call themselves a religion uh, even the atheists and, and witches and, and all these different type things here. And I'm surprised that the uh, Ku Klux Klan hadn't declared themselves a religion because, you know, uh, they were killing people and destroying people back in uh, old days and still some around our country today. But yet the Muslims in their Koran, their book, says, you know, to kill everybody that's not a Muslim and everything. You, know, you talk about a, we have, well, so many good uh, Muslims in our society and everything that supposedly don't go with that, but yet you can see all across Europe and all around the world when they get it to be a certain, you know, percent and everything, the um, moderates supposedly go right along with anything that the other people, you know, decide to do and everything. So we have such a mixture of religion and different kinds of things, a boiling pot in our country, the walls, our country walls are down, the, the borders, and, and we need a Nehemiah from the Lord to come along and do something to help get our country headed back to the God of the Bible, because he's the one that established us 200 years ago, and, and in fact, it was determined that this is a Christian nation. Um, in 19, let's see, well, no, 1892, a U.S. Supreme Court ruling that this was a Christian nation, the Church of the Holy Trinity versus the United States. It's 143 U.S. 457, the finding, you know, the uh, legal finding. And it's a uh, 12SCT511. And for the uh, legal edition it says 36 legal edition 226 these findings in February 26 1892 state that we are a Christian nation and it has not ever been overturned in fact it's not been mentioned much lately you know from all the legal people in Washington DC and everything that know that ruling is there that we are a Christian nation but they just kind of keep it quiet well, the Christian community has too. I haven't heard of anybody, you know, bringing that up in the last few years and everything. But the United States, U.S. Supreme Court declared this to be a Christian nation in that particular ruling. Well, we need a Nehemiah that will come forth. And I think in our Christian community, one of the problems is there's so much uh, error being taught. By so many denominations, like uh, uh, one group says that Jesus went to hell and fought the devil and came out victorious with the keys of the kingdom and stuff. See, there's nothing in the scripture about that. He didn't go to hell to fight the devil. When Jesus died on the cross from that time until he was resurrected, it says in um, 1 Peter chapter 3, chapters 3 and 4, it says, 
he helped camp me. It says he, in the spirit he went to the spirits of the Old Testament and he actually preached to them. It says three times there. It doesn't say exactly what he said or exactly who he went to, but he didn't go to hell and fight the devil. Another reason, because the devil's never been in hell. The devil has never been in hell. He's not in hell today as I speak. He's not going to be. If you look in Revelation chapter 20, verse 10, it says the uh, um, devil and his angels were cast in the lake of fire. Then verse 11 and 12 talks about you know the uh, white throne judgment, uh, opening the books, and everybody whose name is not written in the book of life is cast into the lake of fire. And then the next verse after that, um, 13 and 14, says that hell and everything in it was cast into the lake of fire. See? So the devil's never been in hell. He's here on earth deceiving people and um, and doing everything he can to damage the image of God, the image of uh, Jesus, and the grace, the changed heart, the, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ to uh, welcome us into the family of God. He's doing everything he can to confuse this and keep people from receiving Christ in their heart for salvation. And the reason he's doing it is because he hates Jesus. The devil hates Jesus. Um, and that's his whole purpose before he is cast in the lake of fire is to deceive as many people as possible and have them be tormented with him. In um, Matthew chapter 21, I mean, chapter 21, verses, uh, let's see, verse 41. Jesus explains there that... Uh, Then shall they say unto them on the left hand, this was a uh, separation of the sheep and goats, and the goats being the lost people, the ones going off in the lake of fire. He says, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. See, the lake of fire was prepared for the devil and his angels, not for one person. But the devil is here on earth deceiving people. That's why we have so many different denominations and everything, because people in their pride will say, well, bless God, I just believe this and this and this. And, you know, and they stick to it. They say, if it's good enough for mom and dad, it's good enough for me. And things like this, you know, instead of seeking out, seeking the Lord for the truth of his word, because when we stand before the Lord, that's what we're going to have to answer for. And whatever denomination you might be in, you might have a bunch of good friends and neighbors and everything, just all nice people and everything. But then, see, you have another denomination that had a bunch of nice friends and people, and they're just as nice and everything and, and friendly to each other, but they believe exactly opposite. So who's right? God will only back up his pure word, and we don't have two or three hundred copies of his pure word, you know, that is different because see, it says in Ephesians chapter 4, we have one God, one Lord, one faith, one faith. God's not going to tell uh all these people, different things like this. I tell one that speaking of the devils, of, I mean, speaking of <laughs> tongues of the devil, and then the other speaking of tongues is from him. You know, he's not going to tell, you know, something like that. But we have denominations teaching, preaching, good people speaking of tongues of the devil. We have another denomination over here saying speaking of tongues, the best thing that ever happened. And stuff like this. Others say that God doesn't heal the day like, he, like Jesus did then. He just healed the, you know, to support his word that he was bringing forth and everything. But it says 14 times in the scriptures that Jesus healed all that were sick in those great multitudes. Just think of all those thousands of people he healed. And then others say that God does heal the day like that. You know, both can't be right. It's possible both wrong, but, you know, they both can't be right. But then uh, it just on and on like that. And you ask people, you know, about salvation or something. What does it take to be saved? In, in your particular nomination, I, I would guess that you could probably ask the next 10 people you meet and your friends and relatives, and every one of them would probably tell you something different. Salvation is not being discussed, but the new covenant for salvation in this day is God's prophecy through Ezekiel in verses, uh, chapter 36, verse 26, where God says, A new heart also will I give you, a new spirit will I put within you. I'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh. I'll give you a heart of flesh. And I'll put my spirit in you. 
And Jesus says in John chapter 3, you must be born again. And that's what happens when he creates in us in that new heart, new, clean, pure heart. And then his spirit of Christ comes to live in that heart. We are born into the family of God. Like Galatians 4, 6 says, and because your sons God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, wherefore you no more a servant but a son, and if a son, then heir of God through Christ. And that's the only way to be born into the family of God. Have you received that transformation? That's the most important thing in your life here on earth is to know, start praying and seeking until you know for sure that you've been born in the family of God, not that you, you just lived a good life and, and have a bunch of good friends and a group of people in your church and it just oh it must be so good it feels so good and everything have you received the new heart the new life that only comes from the spirit of christ coming into your heart pray and seek and make that the top priority of your life until you can know for sure you're a child of god and you're prepared to stand before jesus good day And you know, as Christians, we have a new heart from God and the Spirit of Christ, God's power in us. God is love, and His Spirit is in our hearts. In John, 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, it says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love, God, casts out fear, because fear is torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love or God yet. So in James 4, 7, the scripture says, Submit therefore to God. Or his spirit in you resist the devil fear and he the devil in fear will flee from you when you start getting apprehensive about something like starting to fly or a storm coming looking ahead at what might happen to you in your job your health don't just worry and think about these future events or maybe something that you're even going through right now Philippians 4 6 says when you start getting anxious turn to God then by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be known to God your request and your concern to be known to God worrying won't help you one bit but it will cause you to miss God's blessings to you during that time so choose make the choice yourself to set yourself in submission to God in prayer talking to God and counting your blessings from past things experiences with God then watch the devil and fear flee from you. Now, always let your anxiety be a red flag to remind you to pray. God loves you. He will hear you. And in First Colossians one twenty seven, Christ in us, our hope of glory. So have a good day. God bless you. And be set free. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at rahardin.com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit amazon.com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. For past programs of God's Pure Word of Faith, go to www.spreaker.com. That's Spreaker. S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R.com. In the search box at the top of the page, enter my name, Richard Harden, H-A-R-D-I-N, and click on it. A picture with a cross and God's Pure Word of Faith, Richard Harden, will show up. Click on the picture of the cross. A listing of all the past programs will then show up. God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden can now be heard Monday through Friday mornings at 7 a.m. Central, 8 Eastern, and on Sunday mornings at 6 a.m. Central, 7 Eastern. Join him and let's turn our country back to God. It only takes a spark to start a forest fire. Let's get on fire for the Lord right here on K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network.